Welcome everybody to week two's first lecture uh, for the course Arming the State. This particular, this particular set of lectures is going to focus on the production side of the arms trade and production system. Uh, the first lecture is going to primarily focus on the incentives that a state has to begin to, to develop and invest in a, in a domestic defense industry. The follow-on lectures are going to step forward through that looking at if a state decides to invest in, in a domestic defense industry, it's going to look at the requirements for the investment and in actual uh, development of production. And then from there, it's going to move on uh, to the uh, structure of the arms industry really within the past 20 to 30 years and kind of get an idea of how traditional conceptual ways of, 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 of how we thought of the domestic defense industry, especially the ladder of development, changed over time. So let's go ahead and jump into the first lecture, looking at the incentives to invest and develop a domestic defense industry. The largest incentive, and probably the most obvious to most of you, is that the investment and the development of a domestic defense industry increases a state's auto autonomy politically, both internationally and domestically. The ability to provide for their own arms ensures that they can make decisions both internally, let's say, to domestic rights and internationally as well. So dependencies on foreign suppliers leave a buyer open to attempts by the supplier to withhold deliveries in order to coerce the purchaser into making concessions on national issues such as human rights or international issues such as combating terrorism and drug trafficking or opposing a common regional threat. In Japan, for example, proponents of the autonomy in arms production perceive this industrial strategy as providing Tokyo with greater freedom of action in international affairs. At the same time, it arguably helped to strengthen Tokyo's security relationship with the U.S., permitting Japan to play a larger role in the bilateral alliance between the two nations. So to really begin to understand why autonomy in arms production is such a value to the state, we really have to go into what's called resource dependence theory to kind of help you understand why it's such a big deal. Resource dependence theory asserts that resources are keys to organizational success, and that access and control over resources is a basis of power. Resources are often controlled by organizations not in the control of the organization needing them. In this case, in this lecture and in this course, Arms are the resource, and the state is the organization. So the only way to augment power within this type of relationship is either to absorb your dependency, which means if you're dependent on an external source for the supply of arms, you have two choices. Either you could build your own, absorb the dependency, or you can choose to begin to diversify the places that you import arms from. Most states, especially today as arms have become more expensive, lack the ability to fully absorb the constraints or the dependence of arms production. So they look to diversify. And we, we can see this over and over and over again, especially in the past 10 to 20 years when states really began to understand that diversification was a way to augment the power that exporting states had over them. We can see this in the UAE pivoting towards France for the Dassault Raphael aircraft over U.S. options. Part of the reasons were is the U.S. was not going to let them get the F-35, and they thought that they could extract some sort of concession from that. Instead of giving the U.S. a concession, the, U the Emiratis just turned around and said, oh, well, I'm going to go buy that from another player. The same thing occurred when we look at Turkey uh, with, the S300, with the S300 deal. There was an immense amount of pressure coming from the U.S. onto Turkey a after the coup. I, I believe it was in 20, how would it be, 2016 now? There was an, an immense amount of pressure um, from the U.S. towards Turkey to essentially care more about human rights within the nation after the coup was put down. And there was a curtailing of arms exports into Turkey. And instead of Turkey acquiescing and, 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 and falling into line with the U.S. and what, what domestic policies the U.S. wanted Turkey to adopt, Turkey just pivoted towards Russia for arms and said, okay, well, there's other places I can get arms from. So we're seeing more and more that even though states can absorb that dependency by creating their own domestic defense industry, 
they've understood that diversifying is the next best thing. But before we dive into diversification, which we're going to touch on to a great amount in the coming weeks, let's pivot back towards the incentives that states have to begin to develop a domestic defense industry. One of the most powerful incentives is going to be the political incentives. And this goes back to the concept of auton- of, auto- of, auto- of autonomy. And in the last lecture, the sorry, the last slide, I had mentioned the example in Turkey and the example in the UAE. Politically, the ability to produce your own arms gives you the ability to institute your own policies, both domestically and internationally. This is incredibly important. Most states found out about this the tough way through arms embargoes or arms restrictions being placed on them. So we look at countries like Israel or we look at countries like in like India as well. Those countries really began to fully invest or invest a great amount of money into the development of their domestic defense industries after experiences of arms embargoes or arms restrictions. So the lesson was learned there. These countries understood that if you were beholden to one supplier of arms, let's say the United States or Russia, if you're beholden to one supplier of arms, the amount of power that that supplier has over you and the ability for them to coerce you both domestically and internationally is incredibly great. And the way to diffuse that, the way to take back some of your power is start to is start to be able to produce your own arms. But there are also security incentives to develop your own and invest in your own domestic defense industry as well. First, arms production autonomy provides for the supply of security for the military. You no longer risk a supply cutoff. If you're producing your own arms and somebody embargoes your country, it doesn't matter. You can keep producing your own arms. Again, just like just like the last example uh, of the political incentive, most countries come to this realization after being affected by arms embargoes or supply restrictions. A great example here is the Israeli investment in arms uh, in its domestic defense uh, industry uh, in 1948, during or right after the Arab-Israeli conflict of 1948, when both Brit- Brit- Britain and the U.S. refused to supply arms to Israel in a time of war. There's also, again, the Turkish exam- example after the 2016 coup attempt. The ability to produce your own arms ensures that your country has the ability to protect itself. That's a major incentive. Arms production has often been seen as an important mechanism for driving a country's overall economic development and industrialization. Hence, there are economic incentives in investing and creating your own defense industry within your country. Defense industrialization has potential backward linkages, spurring the expansion and modernization of other sectors of the national security economy, such as steel, machine tools, and shipbuilding. Industrialization and technological advancement were seen as feeding into the development of domestic arms manufacturing capabilities, building up general skills and know-how, and in providing lead-in support or equipment for arms production. The construction of warships, for example, stimulated the establishment of indigenous shipbuilding industries. While the production of military vehicles required steel mills and automotive factories to provide critical parts and components such as armor plating, chassis, and engine man- manufacture, as well as skilled la- labor for the vehicle ex- assembly. Now, both Brazil and South Korea, for example, pursued parallel strategies of security and development building up their heavy industry and high technology sectors at the same time as they strove for self-sufficiency in arms production. The other economic incentives that tend to follow on from that is many countries, when they begin to invest in their own domestic defense industry, they think that by producing their own arms, they're actually going to lower the price of arms, which theoretically, I we can understand why a state may think that, but in practice, it's often not the case. The amount of money that you have to toss into a domestic defense industry, even to begin to build the most simple small arms, usually makes so small arms or any, any type of pro- product that you're, you're going to end up producing cost way more than what you could buy it on the open market. A lot, a lot of times, like Think of it as how much it costs you to make bread at home. Chances are right now, if you get all the ingredients to make bread at home and you factor in the time that it takes for you to make bread and the power that it's going to take for you to turn on the oven to bake the bread, chances are it's going to cost more than just going to the store and buying a piece of bread. 
it's the same way with arms now, since there's so many uh, suppliers out there willing to sell you arms. Many countries also see that, uh, think that if they can produce their own arms, that they could engage in market trade and be able to make some of that money back. The problem is, is what the arms market has really taught us over the past 50 years is states don't want the basic stuff now. They want to get the highest tech stuff they possibly can. So many of these smaller countries that are beginning to first invest in their arms in, uh, industry produce these very low tech, easy to manufacture type of arms that really aren't marketable on the market. Most countries just don't want that. One benefit of creating a domestic defense industry is usually it's going to keep skilled labor within the country because most of these countries, especially developing nations that decide to, that decide to invest in these domestic defense industries, they tend to have a very small pool of skilled wor workers. Developing an industry keeps those wor workers there and also can expand the knowledge base and increase the amount of skilled workers in the country. Theoretically, that's not necessarily the case all the time, as you all have found out by doing the readings that are linked below within the description. Something that you're going to hear a lot of, especially those of you uh, within the defense industry and the military, is there's a lot of talk about spinoffs. And spinoffs were really apparent, especially in the early years of arms production, or rather the early years of modern arms production shortly after World War II. Now, the reason for that is because most of the arms that um, companies would produce during that time period were relatively unsophisticated, and they were easily applicable to other trades and other things within the civilian world. So if I'm going to build an aircraft engine for a bomber, chances are I'm going to be able to use that within an, air, uh, an airliner as well. If I'm developing a large engine for a tank, chances are I could put that into a truck. As the defense industry has geared more and more towards incredibly high-tech arms, the applicability of, 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 of spin-off man, man, manufacturing and dual-use goods is, is becoming less and less and less. Defense arms are becoming so specialized that the ability to apply them to anything else or the even the ability to spin off certain uh, pieces of your domestic defense industry to apply to civilian goods it's just not really there anymore. That's not saying that it doesn't happen and it's not saying that it can't occur. Just usually you'll hear spin, spin, spin offs, at least in my experience in the industry, you'll hear it a lot. And the factual basis for it just isn't there now. It's, it's, it's really kind of a, 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 a smoke and mirrors. There isn't a lot of opportunity for that, but states still perceive that. And even when you look at states that are still investing in an incredible amount in the domestic defense industry, let's take in, uh, India and Brazil, for, exa for example, they still couch the discussion of investment in these industries very much into the spinoff. Well, if I invest this money, not only does it help out the military, but it's also going to help out you, the ordinary person. But the fact is, especially, again, with many of these high-tech arms, spinoffs and other economic benefits in the civilian market aren't there as much as they were in the past. This is probably the one incentive that is talked about the least, but it's the most obvious, at least to me. And I really like to harp on it a lot whenever I teach this class. And we're going to go over um, more of the institutional aspects of the arms industry in the coming weeks, which dives into the same concepts. The symbolic nature of having your own arms industry cannot be understated. If we look throughout history, every great power has had its own very vibrant, very robust arms industry in which they led the way as far as the international state hi hierarchy. If you remember back to week one, when we, when we were going over Krauss's work, Krauss even talks about it, about how if you look at the domestic defense uh, industrial landscape, the countries that lead the way there are likely to mirror the countries that are the great powers at that point in time. The symbolic nature of having the, a domestic defense indus uh, industry often provides the overwhelming motivation for a state to begin to invest. Take the political, take the security, take the economic ben, 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 benefits, much of the time, those are secondary to the symbolic nature of being able to produce and market your own arms. The ability for you to have a parade, like in China, 
where all of those arms are made in country is an immense source of pride. Even if we look at smaller nations like Argentina in the 1970s, the dictators within Ar- Ar- Argentina often would lean back on the fact that they had a vibrant, robust arms industry at that point in time to try to increase pride, even when everything else was going to crap. It's going, well, yeah, things are bad now. You can't buy bread. But hey, look, we are a serious power to be taken seriously. The symbolic nature of arms, and especially high-tech arms, cannot be understated. States look for this because that has become a symbol, something that we find synonymous with being a great power. Think about it. Think of every great power or every country that you ever thought was the biggest deal in the world at any point in time. They probably produced their own arms. And not only did they produce them, they were probably at the cutting edge of some type of military arm at that time. Again, the symbolism between the production of arms is intertwined with the state. To be legitimate as a state, many states perceive that a requirement is to be able to protect yourself and build your own arms. Again, here, just like last week, we see that the concept of the state and the domestic defense industry are wrapped up and are confounded within one another. 